To put it plainly, Canada is not on a promising trajectory when it comes to restoring any semblance of housing affordability in the next decade. Over the past three years, Canada has regrettably gained more notoriety for its soaring housing costs than its breathtaking landscapes and iconic northern stereotypes. This issue has garnered significant attention from Canadians across the nation and has even made international headlines for good reason. Even as Canada has emerged as one of the most desirable destinations within the G7 to immigrate to, attracting millions of newcomers annually, this influx, amongst many other elements, has elevated housing into a pressing financial concern, one that is increasingly viewed as a matter of basic human rights, where the cost of property has transformed into an exorbitant luxury, effectively delineating a sharp socioeconomic divide, determining who can financially advance in this country and who cannot. In fact, this likely comes as no surprise to you. Property values in major metropolitan hubs like Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, and Ottawa have surged to levels that are widely considered to be exorbitant, unsustainable, and undoubtedly leading to an economic meltdown. But the question is, are they really? That's what everyone wants to know. So in today's video, as a Canadian finance content creator deeply entrenched in the real estate landscape myself, I aim to shed light on the intricate dynamics that are unfolding in Canada, which encompass both federal and municipal issues, ultimately steering us down a challenging path with, I'll just say it now, a bleak outlook for improvement in the near future. And I'll be blunt as well. Housing isn't a primary federal responsibility. Despite the United States being Canada's largest trade partner, Canada ranks last in GDP size out of the G7 nations. But surprisingly, over the past couple of years, Canada's household debt per capita ratio has taken first place, largely fueled by increased mortgage debt. In fact, as of 2021, Canada's household debt surged to a staggering 7% higher than the nation's total GDP, which represents a noticeable uptick from 2010 when household debt stood approximately 5% lower than Canada's total GDP, which for the record was still very high nonetheless. But in contrast, the United States witnessed a substantial reduction in household debt as a percentage of its GDP, dropping from 100% in 2008 to roughly 75% by 2021. And similarly, the United Kingdom's household debt relative to GDP declined from 94% in 2010 to 86% in 2021. And the reason why this matters, other than the most obvious fact that more household debt leads to a more precarious economic position in the face of a potential recession, is that household debt tied up in real estate doesn't further contribute to economic growth in a country, which is one factor required to tackling the housing crisis in the first place. But this leads to reasons in that Canadians aren't only facing heightened mortgage baggage, but are also high users of credit lines and other debt instruments to finance lifestyle. Naturally, Canada's escalating household debt can be largely attributed to the substantial surge in real estate values, where a recent report from the CMHC highlights that a staggering 75% of Canada's total household debt is linked to mortgages alone. This correlation is unsurprising as the upwards trajectory of home prices in Canada is mirrored by a corresponding rise in household debt levels. But to what extent has the Canadian housing market surged and what is its current standing, especially in light of the rapid five-fold increase in interest rates over a very short time span? You would think this would have a significant impact on house prices. Well, one critical aspect to consider is that Canada's population is heavily concentrated in urban metropolitan areas, with nearly 74% of Canadians residing in or around large urban centers. And it's crucial to bear this in mind throughout our discussion because unlike in the United States where properties are spread across the country at more affordable values relative to income, most Canadians neither have the privilege nor the inclination to relocate to rural areas, which is due to the limited infrastructure available and financial opportunities in those regions. 
So despite Canada's vast landmass, the majority of its population resides within 100 kilometers of the United States border, primarily gravitating towards bustling urban centers. And we'll delve deeper into this phenomenon later in the video, but it's worth noting that the millions of immigrants who come to Canada are not typically choosing to settle in northern Manitoba. As a result, the Canadian housing market experiences significant fluctuations that are predominantly shaped by the dynamics of the five key metropolitan areas, the Greater Toronto Area, the Greater Vancouver Area, Montreal, Ottawa, and Calgary. Let's actually take a look at a chart depicting the average sold price and transaction volume in the Greater Toronto Area, which happens to be Canada's largest market. Although the average sold price has experienced a significant decrease since its peak in February of 2022, it still falls far short of the kind of substantial correction that many prospective buyers were anticipating to finally make an entry into the market at a more affordable price point. And this is particularly noteworthy given the five-fold increase in interest rates during this same time frame. It's worth noting that this same phenomenon holds true across all major metropolitan areas in Canada, as made evident with these charts, where the average sold price remains up 2% nationwide over a 12-month period. So yeah, this certainly isn't the crash that many have been expecting in light of higher interest rates, but nonetheless, the real financial burden for many has become monthly carrying costs, not the actual price of assets themselves having slightly decreased. To provide a clear perspective on this scenario, let's consider an individual who bought a $1.3 million home in February 2022 with a 20% down payment at the prevailing average five-year fixed discounted mortgage rate of 1.42% over a 25-year term. Well, their monthly mortgage payment would have amounted to around $4,100, of which $2,900 of each monthly payment is equity. In stark contrast, if the same buyer were to purchase a $1.08 million home today with a 20% down payment, taking into account the current average five-year fixed mortgage rate of 5.5%, their monthly payment would soar to $5,300. And notably, only $1,350 of each payment would contribute towards building equity. However, this observation pertains specifically to fixed rate mortgages, a financial instrument that countless Canadians now find themselves wishing they had opted for over the past three years, rather than choosing its alluring counterpart, the variable rate mortgage. Fixed rate mortgages, as the name suggests, entail locking in an interest rate for a specified duration, typically one, three, or five years here in Canada. And this is in contrast to the United States, where you have the option to secure a rate for 25 or even 30 years locked in. Consequently, even if your mortgage amortization period spans 25 years, you'll encounter multiple loan renewals at different interest rates over this duration. And this implies that for those fortunate enough to have secured a 1.8% five-year fixed rate in 21 or 22, all of these mortgages will come up for renewal within the next 12 to 24 months at prevailing interest rates. This situation has the potential to create financial stress for millions of households across Canada that secured favorable rates during the pandemic, and despite having a lower principal balance to repay when the term does expire, monthly payments could rise significantly if interest rates do not begin to decrease. So while it's currently uncertain certain when such a decline might occur, it's essential to recognize that any predictions you may see online are purely speculative at this point. Now, the most significant financial turbulence, however, has unfolded in the world of variable rate mortgage loans, where, as the name implies, these mortgages see their interest rates change throughout the term, mirroring shifts in the underlying interest rates established by the Bank of Canada. Let's recall that at the peak of the pandemic in early 2020, the Bank of Canada made a historic move by reducing its benchmark interest rate to an unprecedented low of 0.25%. Consequently, there was a surge in demand for variable rate mortgage loans, and over the subsequent two years, borrowers enjoyed some of the lowest floating rate debt 
ever witnessed in Canada. This surge has resulted in variable rate mortgages now accounting for approximately one third of all Canadian mortgage debt as reported by the Bank of Canada, which is a substantial increase from the 2020 share at the close of 2019. In fact, during the pandemic, mortgage rates reached historic lows, plummeting to as little as 0.85% for a 5-year variable rate loan and 1.39% for a 5-year fixed rate loan, rendering variable rates unusually more popular than they'd been only a few years prior. However, the repercussions of this trend are now becoming apparent for hundreds of thousands of borrowers as interest rates have skyrocketed heavily impacting monthly payments. With the rise in interest rates, borrowers have witnessed a corresponding increase in their monthly mortgage payments. To illustrate a mortgage payment of $1,475 at the variable rate of 0.85% in 2020, of which $1,200 went towards building equity, has now escalated to over $2,500. However, the portion dedicated to equity dwindles to a mere $580. Moreover, this situation may only exacerbate with the rising costs of everyday goods and services in stark contrast to wage growth that's far behind inflation and real estate value growth. Unfortunately, it gets even worse for those who opted for variable rate fixed payment mortgages, where the alarming reality is that in Canada, roughly 75% of variable rate mortgages employ fixed payments, where in these specific mortgages, when interest rates fluctuate, the total mortgage payment remains unchanged, but there is an adjustment in the portion allocated to interest as opposed to principal. For instance, consider a $5,000 monthly mortgage payment scenario. In 2021, when interest rates were lower, perhaps $3,500 was directed towards building equity, while the remainder covered interest costs. However, if we leap ahead to today's interest rates, out of that same $5,000 payment, only a fraction, possibly just a couple hundred dollars, may be contributing to principal paydown. And if that's not already difficult enough on borrowers' financial financial reality, when interest rates undergo significant increases as we've experienced in 2023, those with fixed payments on their mortgages may eventually find themselves in a situation where these payments solely address interest and don't contribute to reducing the principal balance of the loan at all. This pivotal interest rate, known as the trigger rate, marks the point at which the situation unfolds. Should interest rates exceed the trigger rate, borrowers may find themselves themselves obligated to increase their mortgage payments to cover the additional interest expense, or in some cases, witness an expansion of the total loan's principal balance, consequently prolonging the loan repayment period. What's raising concerns in the Canadian mortgage landscape is that among the 30% of the total mortgages in Canada comprising variable rate fixed payment mortgages, the Bank of Canada projects that approximately 50%, equivalent to nearly 13% of all Canadian mortgages, have already crossed their trigger rate. And this proportion is expected to increase further if the prime rates set by banks continue to climb. That's a lot of mortgage holders that are in financial hot water right now until rates hopefully decrease once inflation has been deemed under control. Now, given this data, you might be wondering whether thousands of borrowers who are now underwater on their monthly payments could potentially face dire financial circumstances, even resulting in home repossessions by banks, where such a scenario could potentially lead to an influx of supply in the housing market, particularly as fixed rate mortgages come to maturity over the next 12 to 24 months. Well, although that scenario actually sounds quite plausible, the current data simply isn't showing many signs of wide-scale foreclosures across the country. In fact, according to data compiled by the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, CMHC, as of the second quarter of 2023, the mortgage delinquency rate across the country stands at a mere 0.15%, meaning only 1.5 out of 1,000 mortgages are currently in default. And interestingly, this figure is considered considerably lower than the average observed over the past decade. If you find this surprising, you're certainly not alone.
alone, as I was also very surprised. But the critical question that looms is how sustainable is this trend over the coming quarters if rates remain high? Well, as mentioned earlier, Canadians are notably among the most indebted societies within the G7, and on a global scale, they rank fourth in terms of household debt relative to GDP. Additionally, as hundreds of thousands of variable rate mortgages in Canada continue to rise alongside persistent inflation, the cost of nearly all daily necessities is also climbing, which has led to TransUnion, the Credit Reporting Bureau, reporting a substantial 43% increase in the average monthly line of credit payment compared to the previous year, while the average monthly mortgage payment has seen a significant 16% uptick. At the moment, this situation remains subject to varying interpretations, but it's not unfounded to speculate that numerous Canadians might be turning to lines of credit and other forms of debt to cope with the mounting costs of living, which includes the considerably higher mortgage payments and that they may be banking on the prospect of weathering a transient phase of financial strain to preserve their assets. Nevertheless, it's prudent to acknowledge that we have yet to witness the full extent of economic repercussions across the country. So where do we go from here though, and is there any glimmer of hope for restoring Canadian housing affordability? To put it plainly, Canada is not on a promising trajectory when it comes to restoring any semblance of housing affordability in the next decade. At present, housing affordability is reminiscent of the levels seen in the 1980s, when interest rates hovered in the mid to high teens. The key distinction today is that house prices have escalated far more rapidly than average wages have since the 1980s, rendering home ownership just as challenging to attain as it was during that era, despite lower interest rates. We can analyze and dissect the topic from various angles, but fundamentally, the current housing affordability crisis boils down to the basic principles of supply and demand in the housing market. And this challenge is further compounded by the fact that renters are now dedicating a much larger portion of their income to rent and other expenses, leaving them further unable to ever accumulate the necessary down payment to embark on the path to home ownership. As it stands today, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, CMHC for short, has estimated that the nation must construct an additional 3.5 million housing units by 2030 to rectify the issue of affordability. This challenge is further exacerbated by a situation where population growth remains high while economic growth lags behind, primarily due to the elevated household debt levels discussed earlier, which serve as a constraint on a country's capacity capacity for economic expansion. And by the way, restoring affordability in this context means bringing income to price levels back to 2003-2004 levels as seen on this chart. It's definitely an ambitious goal. At present, the nation's housing stock comprises 16.53 million units, and according to the updated projections for 2023, it is anticipated that by 2030, the estimated housing stock will only reach 18.1 9 million units. However, the situation is more dire than it might initially appear, even at the 18.19 million units projected for 2030. There will still be a shortage of 3.5 million units to meet the demand of 22 million units needed, taking into account the continued growth of immigration levels. The challenge we face as a nation is akin to a catch-22 situation though. On one hand, we require immigration to sustain ongoing population and economic growth since Canadians simply don't have children and our population is aging. However, this high-paced influx of immigrants is exerting additional pressure on an already overburdened demand for housing and rental units, exacerbating the issue further. So look, it might be tempting to assign blame to a particular political party or a segment of the population for the housing crisis, but in reality, Canada's housing challenges 
shortages have been simmering beneath the surface for some time now, with the pandemic serving as a catalyst that brought these issues into the spotlight for all to recognize. As it stands, our primary focus should now be on channeling resources towards crafting effective solutions to address the present challenge. The crux of the matter predominantly hinges on developers' capacity to generate new housing units. This entails streamlining permit issuance, optimizing unit density in major metropolitan areas, and expediting the financing approval process with the CMHC. In fact, a study conducted by the Canadian Home Builders Association aimed at discerning the average approval times in cities across Canada underscores the arduousness of this process. Toronto, in particular, stands out with a staggering weighted average approval time in 2022 of 32 months, far surpassing the average of just over a year observed across the 20 cities included in the study. The central issue here is that unit construction in Canada faces severe bottlenecks due to staffing shortages in the majority of cities. And these shortages, combined with escalating operational expenses for the developers in question, are simply inflating the cost of construction per unit built. But hey, while it's entirely reasonable that most Canadians aren't overly concerned about developers' bottom line, it's important to note that the impediments in permit issuance result in elevated costs and further reduced supply of housing units. And in the face of surging demand, this ultimately contributes to sustained high prices for both homes and monthly rents, which is the primary reason why we haven't yet seen a more severe housing crash. So while the current federal government has taken some, let's just call them what they really are, feeble steps like introducing the first time home savings account and implementing a ban on foreign buyers in the country, these measures are essentially stopgap solutions to the real underlying issue, which remain far from being adequately addressed with the current course of action. It would be really nice to see a more concrete game plan to address the three main issues at hand leading to the housing crisis, with further support to municipal governments, along with more municipal emphasis on rezoning to allow for unit densification through multifamily buildings in the primary metro areas. In fact, a long-standing facet of Canada's housing crisis pertains to the zoning laws that dictate the type of housing that can be constructed in in certain locations around these metro areas. For instance, in Vancouver, the nation's most unaffordable city, a significant portion of the city's land area is still occupied by detached single-family home zoning, as clearly visualized by this interactive map. And by the way, the same is true for several major and small cities across the nation. The lack of space or legislation to support more affordable housing has left many municipalities struggling to provide enough housing for Canada's growing population. So all this to say, the Canadian dream of the single family home with the white picket fence is unfortunately out of reach permanently for millions of Canadians and a pivoting in the type of construction needed to support the type of population growth that we're seeing is paramount over the next 10 years to promote affordability once again. In summary, I really wish I could provide a more definitive answer on whether the Canadian housing market and economy really are truly headed towards Towards major financial turbulence, but the reality is that no one can predict with absolute certainty what the future holds. What is undeniable though is that Canadians born after 1990 will face an increasing hurdle in achieving home ownership and may inadvertently contribute to the growing wealth of landlords as rental prices persist in their upwards trajectory. And when contemplating the potential for significant future turbulence in the Canadian housing market, we can cannot ignore the following undeniable realities. Canadians carry a substantial debt burden, variable rate mortgages are imposing greater pressures on countless households, fixed rate mortgages secured during the pandemic are maturing within the next 12 to 24 months, we currently lack a concrete strategy to reinstate affordability by 2030, and the gap between housing supply and housing demand is simply poised to expand further due to 
population growth. So what do you think? Is Canada poised for a severe housing correction or will price points remain from lack of inventory? Make sure to leave a comment down below sharing your thoughts. My name is Griffin Milks. I really hope you enjoyed today's video and all I ask in return if you did is to subscribe to the channel and share this with someone you think would find it interesting. Have a great day. I'll see you in the next one.